I have the pleasure of introducing to you all T.R. Williams. Uh, T.R. Williams excels in bridging the gap between where people are and where they want to be by artfully blending backgrounds in legal advocacy, public policy, community engagement, and public affairs. Williams was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and she attended Vassar College, where she earned a bachelor's degree in political science and Africana studies with a correlate sequence in Hispanic studies. After graduation, TR participated in the Coral Public Affairs Fellowship Program, completing over 250 hours of training in public affairs, communication, and team building. This fellowship led to her employment at the educational nonprofit organization, the Harlem Children's Zone in New York City. After living and working in New York City, TR decided to return home to Wisconsin to attend law school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Williams has used her educational and professional experience outside of the formal practice of law in holding positions with Milwaukee Public Schools, the Wisconsin Primary Health Care Association, and in the Office of the Governor for the State of Wisconsin. In June of 2021, TR was appointed as the Assistant Deputy Secretary for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. TR believes that effective and efficient communication is grounded in focusing on edifying the listener. Through this type of communication, individuals can be agents of change. TR, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to hearing your keynote. Thank you so very much, Aman. Um, it is truly a humble, uh, humbling moment um, and an honor um, to be here. I am extremely grateful to, to be invited. Um, I have to start with saying that I believe that truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across barriers um, of, of difference and uh, histories. And so, you know, in recognizing in this socio-political climate that there has been the uh, proverbial missing the, the forest uh, to the trees by taking Uncle Ben off of the uh, rice box and telling us that Aunt Jemima pancakes are in fact Pearl Milling Company pancakes. I have to pause to say that it is important that I acknowledge uh, that today I sit in, in my apartment in Madison on what is the ancestral, ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Uh, there are 12 uh, tribal nations that call uh, Wisconsin home, 11 which are recognized uh, federally and uh, acknowledgement sometimes can feel empty. And I, I pause just to say, uh, that is not my intent. Uh, my intent is to uh, pay respect uh, to the elders past and present of those nations, um, to take a moment to consider the treaties made by tribal nations that entitle non-Native people such as myself to live and work uh, on these traditional Native lands, uh, to recognize the forcible taking of the lands of the Ho-Chunk uh, people as well as uh, other tribal nations um, and the root that it has in racism, colonization, and the impact that this violence has had and continues to have on the over 60,000 indigenous people who call Wisconsin home. So I take a moment to acknowledge the land uh, that we are on as well as to apologize for speaking before my elders. If we were in the room together, I would find one to ask for permission to speak ahead of time as is the custom in the, in the family that uh, I grew up in. So Alexis de Tocqueville was a French diplomat, political scientist, and historian. He is known most notably for the, being the author of Democracy in America. After spending some time in the United States in 1831, uh, this is what produced this, this uh, Democracy in America that Alexis de Tocqueville wrote. At the time of the Tocqueville stay in America, the founders of what we know to be the United States now, uh, the authors of uh, what we will now call the U.S. Constitution, uh, were considered traitors, criminals, uh, liberals during the American Revolutionary War. We are now 50 years past that time, and France has an interest in what has been created in what is now the U.S., which is this system of democracy. 
So as Alexis de Tocqueville is taking a roughly 10 months in what will become the United States, uh, he commented on uh, the peculiar institution of the U.S. Certainly democracy itself was peculiar for this French explorer and most of Europe as it does not follow the normal systems of power of, uh, of Europe at the time. So were his observations of peculiarity just about democracy, one could argue possibly, or about the US prison system, which he also looked at. But there was another element to what Alexis de Tocqueville was observing in his attachment of peculiarity to the institution that was being created in the United States. And that was most certainly the institution of slavery. So what is peculiar? about American slavery, about slavery on what will become the United States soil. Well, we know that in 1513 and 1534, these are years that are documented to where we know first Africans to have been known to come to what will become the US soil. Areas of what is now Florida, California, and Texas, they came with Spanish explorers. Fast forward, if those who of you who are familiar with the New York Times 1619 project, in 1619, we have the first British colony uh, in Jamestown, Virginia. The White Lion pirate ship uh, traded roughly 20 African enslaved people for food. And this is marked by the 1619 project as the beginning of US slavery. Anthony Johnson, also known as Antonio the Negro, uh, in 1619, uh, lived in Jamestown, uh, Virginia. He was one of four survivors of a Spanish exploration and served as a guide and a translator. He was not an enslaved person. Anthony would go on to own roughly 250 acres of tobacco farm in Jamestown, Virginia. He owned one enslaved African person himself and also employed uh, roughly a few indentured servants who happened to be white. When Anthony died in Jamestown, the colony of Virginia took his land. His land was not given to his surviving family. They did not inherit this land. The Virginia colony court deemed that since Anthony was a Negro, he was in the court's term an alien and thus had no rights and neither did his family to the land or otherwise. We fast forward roughly 137 years, 1756, Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina at this time was known as Negro country as the population in Charleston reflected more black enslaved people than white citizens. 40% of all enslaved people who would come to the United States or what would become the United States who were kidnapped from there or originating lands would come through Charleston. Charleston uh, boasted rice plantations at this point in what would be US history. And on these rice plantations, one third of the enslaved people died within their first year of arrival to Charleston. Two thirds of enslaved children died before the age of 16 in what would be the rice plantations and system of slavery in Charleston. We get to 1776. These same traders of the British government who declared themselves independent and then who memorialized this independence in writing through what will become one of the US's founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, while also enslaving roughly 700,000 people, comes into effect then in 1794 with Eni Whitney's invention of the contingent. So now we fast forward from 1619 to 1794 in what is now US history with the Declaration of Independence, but was still fighting the American Revolutionary War with Britain. Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin would make the production of cotton profitable in a way that it had never been. And it would give way to what we now call in history as King Cotton and the Second Middle Passage. The first middle passage being embarking on what was uh, kidnapped African bodies going through ships into what will become the US soil. The second middle passage refers to the transporting of African bodies, enslaved people from the South into the deep South. This second middle passage 
of moving uh, enslaved people was to expand with King Cotton, the plantations which we would most know in history of the cotton plantations, which would be a mark of American slavery. At this same time, we have in 1830, the Indian Removal Act, forcibly removing indigenous populations for their, from their lands for this expansion of slavery of the Second Middle Passage. Forks of the Road in Natchez, Mississippi was the second largest slave market in the US. Of particular interest at Forks of the Road, overwhelmingly for those who were buying at this market, typically white men, were enslaved black women. And so the question does beg is why was this a particular interest? Well, it was the ability for enslaved black women to reproduce the next slave generation, to breed a labor force versus the continuing buying of a new labor force. And that's where the peculiarity comes in that Alexis de Tocqueville shares with us in his observation of democracy in America. Of all the slave economies in the world, because it certainly was not a new system in what will become the US, in Europe, or even on the continent of Africa itself. But of all the slave economies in the world, only the US enslaved populations had a natural increase. And I put natural in quotes because there was nothing natural about it. What we're talking about is the breeding of people who would follow the status of their mother and thus would be slaves. What started at roughly 400,000 kidnapped and enslaved African bodies imported into what would become the US grew to almost 4 million enslaved people by the start of the US Civil War in 1861. And so I know the question has to be, TR, why are we starting with slavery? We're talking about the celebration of the resilience and the ex excellence of, of communities of color. We seem very far away from that. Well, I can, I can assure you that I do not start with slavery uh, because I believe that that is the beginning of black history. I also do not start with slavery because of having it purpose to make anyone feel bad or shame or guilt or pain. I would define, uh, a good litigator is one who can be persuasive to effectively move others to see what they see. And it is, you know, no secret that I am certainly trying to persuade all of you who are joining us today of something. So when I ask some of the greatest litigating minds that I know who happen to often go to law school with me, what makes a great litigator? How are you all the best at what you do? What they agreed on was that it included diligence, whether that's diligence in communicating or orating or diligence in listening or whether it was diligence in honesty, that that's what made a good litigator. That's what allowed someone to effectively persuade and move others to see what they see. And so what am I trying to persuade? Why do I start with history, slavery? Why are we starting there as a, as a point in US history? is to consider that the brilliance and the resistance of communities of color in what is now the US is in fact integral to the success of democracy that we are currently living in and arguably fighting for. To be diligent as those great litig litigators that I remire and to respect, I have to present the facts of slavery in this country and how race was legalized, socialized, and institutionalized so that anything not white was othered. And specifically that black bodies were de jure alien, slave, non-citizen and criminal. I believe the math alone can provide the evidence. So if you indulge me in a moment, lawyers are not known for their prowess with math, but I have notes. If we think about the beginning of what would become the US, 1776 as a declaration of independence to today, uh, in, the, in July of this year, on the 4th of July of this year, the US existence will mark 246 years, less than 250 years ago. 
It's only when I travel to other countries that I actually realize how young the U.S. is as, as a nation, less than 250 years old. In 1808, per the U.S. Constitution, the importation of slaves was prohibited. That was 214 years ago. On December 6th of 1865, 13th Amendment abolished slavery. That was 157 years ago. The first 89 years of U.S. existence, there was either legal slavery that was based on race, uh, explicitly Black people, and the comedy of this baby nation was flourished with that free labor. In 1964, we have the Civil Rights Act, which ended U.S. apartheid or Jim Crow, and that was 58 years ago. When I think of the, the comedian and awesome actress of Betty White, and I think of these times of 157 years ago of American slavery and 89 years ago of having uh, 89 years of the US existing existence being um, including slave-based race, knowing that she died at almost 100 years old also helped to really ground these young numbers that we're talking about. 188 years of the 246 years of U.S. existence included either legal enslavement or denial of citizenship to Black people, which is more than half of the U.S. existence. So those treasoners, those traitors, those rebel rousers, those rioters, those criminals, those liberals, in daring to not only dream but to fight for their independence, uh, against the oppressive mother country of Britain, who founded these United States, those heroes of democracy are argued by some to have been able to lead the US into what is now their superpower status and wealth because of the sovereignty of God or some higher, power, higher being, excuse me, deeming it as such that the US has been blessed with this power. Some believe that those founders uh, had an ingenuity, vision, and intellect, the tenacity to be studied and fought and killed for the notion of a nation that they then got to build, not throwing away their shot. If those of you catch that is Lynn Manuel's playing Alexander Hamilton sings in act one and two of the musical or Broadway musical. Well, despite those theories of why the US has been able to rise in its short time period, I would offer that what the receipts cannot deny is that those 89 years of free labor that this country was able to be built on by the work of enslaved Black populations bred in this de jure system of race that othered and dehumanized them as three-fifths of a person certainly was a foundation for the wealth that the U.S. enjoy today. So what is this promise of democracy? What is this a peculiar situation of democracy that we started off with. UW Madison's own associate professor in the Department of Afro-American Studies, Dr. Christy Clark Pajara, recently gave a lecture titled, A History of Resistance, Reclaiming Community um, Health Before 1860. And loosely closing Professor uh, Clark Pajara, she asserted that Black people were certainly oppressed by slavery, but not destroyed by it. Destroyed people don't create culture. In this age of the Google, our grandfather of Black History Month, Dr. Carter G. Woodson's vision may be somewhat realized in that the account of the narratives of resilience, excellence, and culture creation and cultural impact of Black people on the U.S. and in the U.S. is only a few clicks or taps of the thumbs away for anyone who desires the knowledge. Dr. Sherry Ann Charleston, UW Law School grad, class of 2012, I believe, and the chief diversity inclusion officer at Harvard University wrote, the history of black Americans is filled with the histories of the ways common people sought to make meaning of a promised citizenship every day. It was this connection between the retelling and history and promises of democracy that Dr. Carter G. Woodson explained that we have a wonderful history behind us. If you are unable to demonstrate to the world that you have this record, 
The world would say that you are not worthy to enjoy the blessings of democracy or anything else. Although not a UW law alum, Milwaukee Municipal Court Judge Derek Mosley takes the time each Black History Month to share the stories of invention, art, creativity, courage, tenacity, and overcoming of Black Americans in the past and in the present. In this, in this February State of the State Address, our Governor Tony Evers called on all of us to continue the grand experiment of democracy with fervor and together. And I would add without fear. And so in me sharing with both Amon and, and uh, UW Boston so that I wanted to provide time for a Q&A, especially in this virtual world, I think that can be most dynamic. I will, I will end uh, with the words of uh, my favorite author, Audre Lorde. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So it is with that that I thank you. I am in looking forward to what are the questions there and the conversation. Thank you so much, TR. Uh, we actually do have a few questions questions in the Q&A already, um, but if you are watching, feel free to drop questions as they come. Um, but the first question we have is, what advice do you have for attorneys who want to branch out from traditional legal practice? That is a great question. Um, as Iman shared with uh, my bio, I, I am not in the formal practice of law. And uh, to my grandmother's uh, chagrin, I, I didn't stay in the formal practice of law very long. I say that even if you don't know what the long-term plan is, uh, because when I chose to leave the practice of law, I didn't necessarily know that I was gonna end up as the assistant deputy secretary for the state of Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Um, but what I was intentional about is what that next step was. So my first non-legal job happened to be with Milwaukee Public Schools. It was not as an attorney, obviously. Um, it was not in the classroom, it was in administration. And that could seem a little bit of a weird flex, but what I knew, even though I didn't know the end goal, is that Milwaukee Public Schools is the largest public school district in the state of Wisconsin. And so me showing up there as a professional would provide me exposure to a new professional network, right? A lot of times lawyers are just sort of dealing uh, amongst each other. Um, so it would allow me to know a lot of different people, get to experience a lot of different types of professional settings other than the law. Um, it also was helpful uh, because there are several opportunities of what you could do in Milwaukee Public Schools because it was so large. And then so in spending time there and having an awesome boss um, there who encouraged me to be able to do um, other professional development, I was able to participate in the Wisconsin Women's Network uh, Public Policy um, Institute. And that gave me, at first I was a little arrogant and it was hard to believe what lawyers could be arrogant. A little arrogant, I thought I knew public policy. I'm an attorney, I understand the civic process, uh, but it was eye-opening. And that was really the aha moment that I had um, to solidify that what I wanted to do was public policy work, whether it was lobbying or whether it was now being an administration for a state government, uh, that's what honed in for me public policy work. So I would say the advice would be to, even if you don't know the end goal of where you want them to go, to move intentionally and strategically, building networks is always great and providing yourself the opportunity and the space um, to learn and have different experiences for you to have that aha moment. All right, we have a question that was just asked in the chat. Um, it says, given the 89 year time span from constitution to abolishment of slavery, do you have an opinion whether or not the evolution of the American public has sped up or slowed down since the abolition of slavery? Hmm. I think that, uh, especially as I think about the comments of youth that happened, I say youth like I'm not that, even though I'm not quite as youth as I thought. Uh, when I think about the comments and the words that came out of the youth who really led um, the movements that happened in the summer of 2020, post the murder of George Floyd, I heard awesomeness, but I also heard this theme 
of feeling like we hadn't been very far and we hadn't gone very far. And so I, I'm giving this answer and wanting to be respectful and um, careful with appreciating new thought, young thought, young people. And also knowing that my existence right now uh, is a big deal to my ancestors. Um, and that what was fought before I was even born, before my parents were even born, or actually while my parents were being born likely, was not a short fight. It was a very long fight um, that required a tenacity that I don't know if we quite understand in the fights that we're currently having. Um, and it was met with an overwhelming amount of, uh, of uh, audacious, uh, conspicuous, uh, regular violence. And it doesn't mean that violence is not happening um, to not only people of color, but those who, have, who don't ascribe to a binary or gender normative uh, sort of uh, prescription. So I'm not saying that violence doesn't exist, but it is in, quite, in fact a different time. Um, and so I have to honor that it is different. We are not fighting colored only, you know, white only signs anymore. We are fighting, you know, the threat to use words like equity or critical race theory. Those are being deemed as liberal and radical, right? The, the idea of uh, middle ground or conservatism is being pulled further and further to the right, where people who have any ideas outside of that are sort of relegated as radical. That is a true fight that we're having now. Um, but it, I think it's hard to necessarily uh, just dismiss that there hasn't been progress. I would also say that um, there's an ebb and flow that we see in history. Um, and that even when there's a new cast of characters and technology <laughs> advancements or medical advancements, that the ebb and flow of, of, of as people of color or marginalized populations have gotten some gains and wins, we have seen in history the uh, backlash of that coming down. And so what I would just say is that uh, now is the time to be diligent, to fight uh, for democracy, to make sure that we're keeping our North Star clear on what was the foundations, good and bad of this country, and where we seek to move forward um, as a nation and a people. That actually leads us into our next question. Um, someone asked, why do we call critical race theory a theory? Hmm. So that is a great question. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who also uh, received her LLM, I believe, from UW Law School, is who I understand to be the, the mother. I'm sure she wouldn't want to be grandmother of critical race theory. Um, I don't know where the theory part comes to it. I don't want to at all step in a space that I am not an, an expert on. Um, but I certainly know that part of what I know of the foundation of what she was creating in critical race theory, in intersectionality, uh, was this concept of uh, being able to broaden, and I would say expand on Carter G. Woodson's vision of how you're putting together a history of the people. Who is determining uh, the person who tells that history? Where do we interrogate what is going to be uh, written down and memorialize this history? How does that work with populations who are only using an oral history? Um, and then how do the victors of war get to tell the story? And so I can't speak exactly to why theory is used instead of critical race facts, uh, but uh, I assume there's an academic reason for it that, that I'm just not privy to. All right, our next question is, what would you say to a law student who may be discouraged by the lack of representation in the legal system? Yeah, it's daunting. Um, it can be discouraging. Um, I don't want to misquote, but I, I heard a quote that basically said, you know, I have to dream of uh, more and of acceptance and of a space because what's the alternative? Um, and so I think that when you're in a space to be intentional and strategic about the space that you're in, um, I think to have a sense of those who came before you and those will come after you to change that. I am careful by saying that every person needs to necessarily take on that burden because that may not be their journey. Um, that may not necessarily be how they show up in the world. 
But I do know that because of, of what we know, the history that we've shared, that it seems at least to me, the least I can do is to try to change any space that I'm in. Um, whether it's the thoughts and the ideas that I share, whether it's how I show up, you know, not as much now, but initially, uh, you know, having dreadlocks and practicing law in a courtroom uh, would have been something to not do to forge your career, you know, so I made an intentional choice that I'm going to show up this way. I am racially marked as a black woman and I show up that way. Um, I am certainly professional, but I push back on what is considered professional language and I show up very authentically as myself. And I think those sort of micro relationships that you have with people combined with the fight that we have on the legal legislative, I should say judiciary legislative, you know, branches of government as well. I think those things still need to happen. But I believe those microaggressions that really allow people to connect their mind and their heart together um, are the ones that that have the power to do the most impact. Um, so be encouraged, know that you're not the only one feeling that way. Um, find spaces to reach out to and be authentically uh, yourself. And if it's not serving, you find another table. I think we need to push back on the concepts of what we think we have to endure or what we have to do, which was part of my decision of, of leaving the formal practice of law, despite how very scary it was to do. So you spoke about relationships. And so we would like to hear your memories of in-person Leo banquets, because this is, I believe, the second year, at least for me, um, with virtual Leo banquets. And so how did you see, how did you build, expand your community at the Leo banquets? And what are you looking forward to uh, as far as being back in person, hopefully next year? That is a good question, because Leo banquets was a thing. That was definitely at Leo banquets. And the Midwest Balsa Academic Conference and the National Black Law Students Conference, like those were my things. And, and at some points in law school, those are what kept me, kept me sane for sure. Um, Leo Banquet is, is certainly uh, an event, right? Uh, I, I, my, me and my group of friends loved dressing up for it. Um, it felt like home. It was a celebration. A lot of alum would come back. Um, in, in varying years of alum, whether it was like those who had just graduated, which was great to see, because sometimes they were a little easier to talk to, like tell us how it really is out there. Because sometimes those alum five years and, and uh, beyond talk about law school in a way that's like, you loved it? It was that? I don't know, right? So that was a great networking experience. And because it rotates amongst the different um, uh, associations, student associations, it was also very um, exciting to have this moment of learning of different cultures, right? And, and what people would do. In fact, um, when I was posting my excitement about this, uh, one of the, the people who I went to law school with uh, was like, was your, was the Leo Bank where you're talking about in 2010, the same year that the, the Deltas did their step show? I was like, it was in fact. And so uh, it's just good energy. It's a good communion. It's a good space to kind of relax and be yourself. Um, you need those balances for sure. Um, so that very first one, I think I was a prospective student actually at that time, that very first one with the, the, the step show with the Deltas was, was a good one. Um, as well as I think it was ILSA, the Indigenous Law Students Association, who uh, brought in um, drummers and had some traditional dance. Uh, yeah, so those are those are all good memories, and um, I'm looking forward to when it can happen safely and we can all be together uh, again for sure. <laughs> So this question turns to your current position. Um, can you discuss ways you've been able to elevate issues of racial equity and awareness about the impact of other systems of oppression in your role at the Department of Health Services? Yep, great question. Uh, so as I came into the role, there were already uh, the building blocks created to um, start our inaugural Office of Health Equity. And so we now have the director of health equity for the Department of Health Services, Dr. Michelle Robinson. And so that's one way for sure. Um, in my first few months, there was a series of uh, all staff, we call it webinars that we did. 
so internally facing um, where I gave a, a extended version of, of some of the history that I brought to this conversation um, and being able to do that webinar sort of created uh, these other moments for conversations. And then there is the difficult work of normalizing that the Department of Health Services, state government in general, has been and continues to be a tool of white supremacy. And not everyone is ready to hear that message. But anytime I'm in a policy meeting, a legislative meeting, an external stakeholder meeting, a procurement or budget meeting, and I'm listening and looking for how we have community voices or don't have community voices at the table, and how we're engaging with the, the problems that are often put at the table of the Department of Health Services, whether it's the disparate impact of COVID on communities of color when it comes to hospitalizations and death, or whether it's what um, is most near and dear to my heart, the disparity of maternal and child um, mortality, infant mortality, excuse me, that black women in particular are five times more likely than white women to die and for their babies to die at birth. And this is regardless of their economic status, their education. Um, and so when I'm in those rooms and in those conversations, I consider it my job as, as the number three spot of leadership over the 6,000 person, $15 billion budget agency that I'm in leadership of is to push, to push people to see that. Sometimes it means making them uncomfortable and it's a level of what I call productive disequilibrium. Other times it's a softer touch, but it's being in the room to ask the questions of whose voice are we forgetting? What is not happening? How do we decide who gets a grant? How does the nature of saying you have to show these um, examples of your work actually create a barrier for grassroots organizations who are mostly impacted by these statistics to be able to show up and, and do the work? Right? How do we create these systems of bureaucracy that actually are barriers to keep people out in the name of you know, consistency or checks and balances? What assumptions are we making to include those checks and balances about the type of people who we think are getting the funds or the resources that we have? Are we blaming poverty on people who are most impoverished? Are we assuming that people who are impoverished are thus criminal, are bad at managing money? And do we put that onus on them in a way that is not, um, not fair? And so those are some of the ways in which that happens as a whole for me and where I'm at as a whole with the Department of Health Services, there's Medicaid, there's public health, um, there's our division of quality assurance. Those are all different ways in which we show up in the state of Wisconsin of looking at the different systems of, of supremacy and oppression um, that have created the disparities we see in race now. Thank you. This is our last question. Um, in your view, what can or should the legal profession either pedagogically or practically be doing in this moment to respond to the current attacks on established elements of American democracy, especially as it relates to preparing future attorneys? That is an amazing question. Um, I think that the profession, I actually just attended um, a webinar called Under the Black Light, Is This the Last Black History Month? It was hosted by the African American Policy Forum, which is Professor Kimberly Crenshaw is the executive director of that forum. It included uh, Jelani Cobbs, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Cornell West, and Sherilyn Eiffel, who's also a Vassar alum. Um, and what she proposed, I thought was the best articulation to answer that question you just asked, which is uh, to take back the 14th Amendment, right? To understand exactly what was the historical, social, political, and legal context of the 14th Amendment coming into existence and to fight uh, fiercely for what that is. Um, I think that because of this time of very high energy and political divide, there is a natural sense for folks to want to bring down the temperature to ease it and feel better, right? To get over COVID, to open things back up, to take off masks, to stop talking about the vaccine and whether it's real or not real, to just all let it go. Those are things that you can do from a place of privilege if your life is not on the line. 
and what educational uh, sort of pedagogical experiments and studies have shown us to be true is that when we create a space for those black and brown babies, those babies with varying levels of disabilities, as well as babies who have different levels of poverty, when we create a space for them to succeed, everyone actually succeeds, right? Which is the point of Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the push of us extending this experiment of democracy, that it is not some moral helping the poor people or the black people or the non-binary gender conforming people along the way, right? It is understanding that their liberty and their participation in democracy is what makes all of this work, is what makes this legit, is what makes a 250 year, less than 250 year old nation be able to become a superpower. And so I would say that the legal profession needs to step up to the plate to, to follow Audre Lorde's words of not operating from a space of fear, uh, to strategically intentionally think about where litigation makes sense and to push the boundaries uh, to have our courts decide versus to make the decision that because the big P or small P political leanings of the courts, either at the national federal level or the state level is already a foregone conclusion. And so we won't fight. Uh, you know, when people say like, oh, where would you ever like to go back in history? For most people um, who have experienced oppression in a history of enslavement, the current space is the best space, right? And so what I would say to that is that these battles that we're fighting are not new and they are certainly different, um, arguably uh, not met with the same type of violence as we did in, in the past. And so for us to lose steam now would be the wrong decision.